It started the second week of my neurology fellowship. I waited by my patient's room, my new neurology reflex hammer, cold and heavy in my hand, and I had a serious case of the intern level butterflies. I had just started a whole new job as a fellow just two weeks ago, and I hoped my attending agreed with my assessment and my plan, and I hoped he didn't find that one attending question they always seem to find that changes everything. He arrived, we went to the bedside to talk to the very worried parents of a three-year-old little girl. He explained how she had partial complex seizure with secondary generalization because of focal cortical dysplasia. The parents leaned forward, they listened intently, and then their eyes began to dart nervously from him back to me and back to him. Then, at some point, dad crossed his arms, they both leaned back, and their eyes glazed over. I realized they had no idea what was being said. We went to the second room. We talked to a two-year-old little boy and his mom, and he explained how he had lysencephaly, and that put him at risk for global developmental and cognitive delay. I watched the whole scene play out again. As we walked out of that room, my nervous butterflies were replaced with a feeling that many of you know very well. And that is the realization that today was going to be a very long day because I was going back to every room to explain what was going on. We finished our rounds. I asked a few quick questions. Then I went back to the bedside of that three-year-old little girl. I explained how she had seizure that had started in one part of her brain and it spread to the rest of her brain because that one part of her brain was disorganized. In the bed, at the bedside of the two-year-old little boy, I explained that he had a smooth brain. And because his brain was formed differently, that meant that he was at risk for having trouble learning to walk, trouble learning to talk, and trouble in school. I went back to every room on our list that day. And for the next seven days. Now, those of you that are familiar with medical education, I will help you out with the math. I had 10 attendings. So I relived that week, every 10 weeks, for the next four years. I learned a lot of valuable neurology from that attending. But I also learned that there had to be a better way to help our families understand some of those difficult concepts that we talk about in medicine and in neurology. Now I'd like to tell you about how I had a discovery that helps me to better communicate. I'd like you to meet Charles Wallace. Charles is six now, and he's doing all right, but his parents have always been worried about him. He didn't gain weight well, we call that failure to thrive, and he didn't talk until he was almost four. Now he tests out as very intelligent, but there's been some concern about autism. Lately, though, he's been pale, there's been some unexplained bruises, and he got out of breath today walking from the house just to the family's garden. This afternoon, his sister thinks that he was starting to hallucinate. And this evening, by the time their mother calls the family doctor to their house, Charles Wallace is in heart failure, and he needs extra oxygen. As he slips into a coma, he begins to have seizures. Now, I've taken care of patients like Charles Wallace as a neurologist, but the interesting thing about him is that he is not one of my patients. Charles Wallace is the character in a book called A Wind in the Door. I first read this book when I was eight years old. One day during that same neurology fellowship, I flashed back to this book and I wondered, did Charles Wallace have the same disease as my patient? So I called my mom. And she's one of those moms, and so I knew that nothing had been touched in the room that my sister and I had shared since we left for college. I was able to ask her to go to the tall bookshelf, three shelves down, she grabbed the book. It arrived three days later. I eagerly reread it, and I came away with two important realizations. First of all, it was a much quicker read than I had remembered. <laughs> and secondly, my suspicions were confirmed. Charles Wallace had a mitochondrial disease. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of our bodies. They provide energy to all of our cells. Now, I pondered my new discovery, and I 
flipped to the front of my book. I traced my finger over my eight-year-old signature and marveled at how you could still read it. And then I looked at the year that the book was published, 1973. In 1973, mitochondrial medicine was just in its infancy. There were patients that doctors were worried about their mitochondria. There was a woman that didn't gain weight well, although she was eating thousands of extra calories every day. There was a family that had balance problems and early dementia, and there were two infants that had slow development and seizure. All of them had thin, weak, and wasted muscles. And when doctors looked at their muscles under a microscope, they saw that the mitochondria weren't normal. And they didn't think they made normal amounts of energy. But that was the extent of what we knew. Charles Wallace is the product of the imagination of a woman named Madeline Langle. She was a liberal arts educated young lady who liked to read science textbooks in her spare time. Charles Wallace doesn't have mitochondrial disease like we understood it in 1973. He has mitochondrial disease like we understand now. It is a complicated disease that in its worst form involves every system in the body. And it is progressive and it is degenerative. I was pretty excited about having put the pieces of this puzzle together. So I mentioned it to my sister. That same sister who had shared that very pink, very untouched room with me is now an AP bio teacher and a science writer. As soon as I told her, she said, I'm assigning this book to my classroom. Will you please come and talk with them about mitochondrial disease? So that's how I ended up going back to high school for the day. Now, my sister had instructed all of her students that they had to ask one question in order to get credit for being there. I did field some unwelcome questions about my fashion choices for that day. <laughs> but after that, I listened to high school students ask medical student level questions about mitochondrial disease. And it dawned on me that just as writing the story of Charles Wallace had allowed Madeline Langle to leap ahead through 40 years of science and medicine, reading the story of Charles Wallace had helped these high school students make a similar leap in their understanding. Since this experience, I have used the story of Charles Wallace to teach mitochondrial disease in an accessible way to medical students and to residents. But this experience has opened my eyes. And now when I'm giving lectures or I'm in clinic, if I think it will help people to better understand what we're discussing, I talk about movies and books and TV shows. Jean-Luc Godard, who was a French filmmaker, once said, sometimes reality is too complex. Stories give it form. I find that using stories to help talk about some of the more difficult concepts in medicine lays a framework of basic understanding. And we can go back and we can fill in those details later from our articles and our texts. And let's face it, learning about a disease by hearing about the disease process of a character like Charles Wallace, well, that creates empathy in a way that reading a list of symptoms off of an up-to-date printout just can't. So going forward, I would like to encourage you to add to your collection of stories so that the next time you are giving a lecture or you are talking to a family and you feel like they're just not quite making that connection, you have another way to help them grasp a difficult concept. Because at the end of the day, one of the most important parts of our job is to make sure that every family understands the story of their child's disease. Thank you.